Welcome to Houston Life. I'm Jennifer Broom. And I'm Derek Shore. The roaring 1920s were a period of change, progression, and growth for our country. City life was bustling as more and more Americans were moving to cities from rural areas. For the first time, many folks owned cars, radios, and telephones. Fueling the change in part were the millions of immigrants who moved to the U.S. and brought with them their own cultures and traditions. Flappers, speakeasies, and prohibition created quite a controversy in the 20s. There was a growing divide between the past and a new modern future. Some embraced the change and welcomed diversity. Others tried to stop it. And that led to the birth of a, of a movement of intolerance and hate, but it also led to a fight for equal rights. One vocal advocate of diversity is highlighted in a new book titled $10 to Hate, and here to tell us about it is the book's author, Patricia Bernstein. Hi, Patricia. Hi, Thanks it's so nice in. to be with you. That was a nice little uh, history lesson for us. Uh, yeah, just thanks. There. I, I can leave now. You've done it. <laughs> Perfect. But let's just jump right into this. Specifically, this book that you've written is all about the KKK right. and the rise of this movement. Why did you write the book? Why now? Well, I had written another book about Texas history, and I was looking around for other topics. And somebody said to me one day, did you know there was a time when the Ku Klux Klan had millions of members, and they weren't just in the Deep South, they were all across the whole country? And I was like, what? I don't believe that. <laughs> because in my lifetime, even though the Klan's still very dangerous and they still kill people, it was all these splintered groups of folks out in the woods, you know, with scruffy beards and missing prominent teeth and so on. Um, and so I started to look into it and I found out that what he had told me was absolutely true. And it was pretty shocking, to tell you the truth. That was the only time in our history that the Ku Klux Klan had millions of members, was during the early 1920s. And they were not just in the Deep South, they were all over the country. And it was kind of like rolling thunder or rolling blackouts. It wasn't strong in every state at the same time. Texas happened to be the state that got the infection first. You know, Patricia, you drew me into this book, and I will admit, I was just going to skim through the book, and it absolutely drew me in, and I'm reading it word for word, but your very first line in your introduction, I wrote this book to remedy ignorance, beginning with my own. You know, I think part of my ignorance with the KKK was I don't think I realized... I thought it was maybe more of a black and white issue. And in the book, you start the first chapter talking about a couple um, and the guy severely beaten mm -hmm. and both of them were white. I know, and everybody uh, assumes it was a black white thing. This was a young World War I veteran, very handsome, strong young man, 27 years old. And he had a family friend who was an older widow uh, she had five children. Their families had known each other for 10 years. They were good friends, and it just happened that they were in this county at the same time. He was working there, and she was trying to survive with her children, and they just enjoyed each other's company, and a rumor started that they were having an, an affair. And it turns out that this version of the Ku Klux Klan, this is Ralph Burleson, the gentleman on the left. This is Fanny Campbell when she was very young. She was only 14 when that picture was taken. But you can see they were both very attractive. And even as a widow lady, apparently, she was still quite attractive, very petite, lots of personality. But I learned that this version of the Klan was not just racist. It was violently anti-immigrant, anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic. And they set themselves up as an enforcer of morality, if you can believe it. Because you just talked about all that change that was happening, and, and some of the people were conservative and didn't really like all of this social change. And the Klan would come in and say, we can do what the law can't do. We will clean up your town for you. And in this, in this instance, so this was what, right outside of Austin, wasn't it? It was um, in Williamson, Williamson County, where Georgetown is. And the beating was actually in a little town called Taylor, which which is still there. And in the book, you describe in great detail how this man is whooped, whipped, a, a chain is tied around his neck, and it is... It's not I mean, easy to read. It is very, very graphic. But as you said, I think the interesting irony in all of this is whether it was the prolonged torture and eventual murder, you know, I mean, some people were tortured for days before they were finally murdered, and all of this was under the guise, as you said, of moral police. Members of the KKK thought that they were doing the communities in the broader United States a favor by using their morals as a basis to justify the torture and killing of others. And some of these photos you have in the book 
are absolutely shocking. To see this, this right here in Houston. Too. This was in Houston. They used to have their initiations in Bel Air, where I, where I live now, out in the cow pastures. And some of the papers would write about it in a very kind of reverential way. But I liked the feisty little Houston press that commented on this particular event. They said, the little cluckums were out in the cold in their nightgowns, uh, scaring the screech owls. And they also said the cows had been removed from the pasture, but most of the bull remained. Oh, interesting. So there was a little, like, I mean, they were being poked fun of in that instance, but they were also very, very serious. Do you think oh, people it was took very them dangerous. seriously? Oh, yes. And uh, one of the interesting things that I discovered was um, I couldn't find any letters that had been saved by Dan Moody. But the judge in the trials that he participated in, who was known to be anti-Klan, had gotten a lot of hate mail, and some of it you can still read. And one night a telephone operator even called him and said, um, I think you're going to want to listen to this call. They could do that in those days. And he heard a Fort Worth lawyer, Klan lawyer, planning with the head of the Austin Klan to kill him. And, and by the way, before we talk about Dan Moody yeah, a little more, this rice. picture of the Rice Institute, this was, I think, also 1921. It's kind of shocking to this see members in of the, the yearbook Klan in the yearbook for Rice <laughs> University. In the activities section. Unbelievable. Uh, and when I first saw this, I thought, well, is this a typical Rice prank? You know, are they just making fun of the Klan? But I found out that one of the big Rice donors at the time pulled his money out because he said they're all in the Klan over there and I don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. Well, so maybe it was real. So let's talk about Dan Moody. You know, He's some the bright folks spot. May, <laughs> some folks may know him as a former governor. Yes. Uh, but give us a little history on it that you go into in the book. Um, well, it was quite a relief to get to Dan Moody's story after studying the Klan and the people who started the Klan essentially as a money-making venture. Um, because he was such a straight arrow. I just fell in love with him. He was Harry Potter, you know, he was Dudley Do-Right. No relation to the Moody family no, not from at all. Galveston. I'm Nothing sure he would have Moody loved Gardens. to have had some of that money growing up. He came from a poor background in this little town. He went off to college with one suit, one pair of shoes, and $65. Yet somehow, 90 years ago, at the age of 33, he became the youngest, youngest governor of Texas. We ever had. And that was because he became famous from five the Klan. These were all the lawyers that were involved in the Klan trials. Now, other prosecutors across the country, and the book tells about a case in California and a case in Louisiana, other people had sincerely tried to prosecute these guys for these assaults as well. But they came up short, and I think part of it was because there'd be secret Klansmen that would get into the grand jury so they couldn't indict, or they'd get on the trial jury so they couldn't convict, or they would convict them and give them a little fine or something, just a slap on the wrist. And Moody was just outraged by this crime in his district. He loved the law. He couldn't handle anybody who thought they were above the law. And also, his first law partner was a Jewish guy he grew up with. He had a beloved teacher from Ireland who was Catholic when he was in high school. And he just didn't want to have any part of it. And he decided through these trials of these five lowlifes that he would put the Klan on trial, not just these individuals. What kind of lessons can we learn, say, from what's going on in the world environment today? Well, that's an interesting topic. When I started working on this, I thought, oh, this is just kind of interesting history, and here's a guy people should remember and know about. And then I started hearing in the public forum people saying things that sounded like Klan speak to me, assuming that all undocumented Mexicans are criminals and rapists, the kind of thing that Congressman Steve King said the other day about how you can't rebuild your civilization with somebody else's babies. What does that even mean? We're white, we're the real people, and everybody else is somebody else? I mean, we're all in this together. And to me, we have spent generations learning how, in polite company, you may think a bad thing, but you don't say it out loud because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. There's certain jokes you don't tell in polite company. Now it seems like we've gone backwards. And it's not just the speech, it's the deeds. You know, the White Lives Matters flyers left on driveways in Alvin just a few days ago, the mosque that was burned down in Victoria, uh, the vandalism of Jewish cemeteries, it's all very disturbing. And also a recent report by the Southern Poverty Law Institute identified yes. about 150 Klan groups still yes. active in the United yes. States today. So this is something that is still here and now. And still killing people, Dylan Roof in Charleston. 
You're from South Carolina, I am originally right? from South Carolina. So I know you know that story of the nine people in the Venerable Church. Oh, of course. And then the cl former Klan leader who killed three people outside of Jewish institutions, none of whom turned out to be Jewish. Um, Patricia, listen, we got to leave it here, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, we are out of time. Moody's, my, my legacy because of the law and public relations. That's how you fight hate. We could have a whole hour to talk yes, about this. Easily. Thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you and for having me. Thank you me. for continuing a very important conversation yeah. that we are glad to be a part of. For more information on Patricia's book, $10 to Hate, you can visit her website at patriciabernstein.com.